Being a disciple maker has been a core focus for Lonnie Berger since he came to Christ in 1975. Mr. Berger has been on the staff of The Navigators, which is an international Christian organization known for discipleship training and leadership for more than 30 years. While in college at Kansas State University, Mr. Berger received his initial Navigator ministry training, and his first staff assignment was behind the Iron Curtain in Romania, where he lived and directed the Navigator work. Not an easy task. And of course, he is the author of Every Man a Warrior. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce Lonnie Berger. Hey, how y'all doing? Can you hear me okay? All right, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. Does anybody know where Omaha, Nebraska is? All right, good. You start here and you go 1,500 miles that direction and you almost get there. Now, in Omaha, Nebraska, we have about a half a million people. But if you drive just 30 miles west, there is nothing. Corn, soybeans, and cows, that's what we have in Nebraska. There are 3 million people in Nebraska and 6 million cows. <laughs> Two years ago, I was in New York City, and a, a cabbie picked me up, and he said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Nebraska. He said, what's Nebraska like? I said, well, we have 3 million people and 6 million cows. And he said, oh, I see. So every person has two cows in his garage. <laughs> I said, well, it doesn't really work that way, but kind of. Farming in the Midwest is a big deal. There was a banker in Omaha that became very, very wealthy. He owned thousands of acres of farmland, tens of thousands of acres of cattle and hogs and all kinds of things. He became very wealthy. And at the end of his life, he decided that he wanted to take his money with him. So one day down at the bank, he took a big suitcase. He got all this money, you know, and put it in the suitcase. And he and his wife took it up to the attic right above his bed, and they put it in the attic so that if he died in his sleep, you know, he could grab it on the way up. Well, three or four months later, you know what happened? He died in his sleep. And, you know, uh, the kids came over, they had the funeral, they, they opened the will, and pretty soon they were doing through all the, you know, the things afterwards to settle the estate, and the kids said, hey, mom, where's all that money? And mom said, well, I don't, I don't know, we we put it in the attic above his bed. Let's go up and see if it's still there. And so they did. They went up there, and you know what? It was sitting right there. And his wife said, I knew it. I knew it. We should have put it in the basement. <laughs> I want to thank you for... The, the wonderful testimonies already that have been shared. And thank you, men, for being vulnerable. Because one of the things that I believe God wants us to change is that the non-Christian world is looking for answers. And they want to know that we as Christians who have real-life problems also have real-life solutions. Now, it's been my experience that Christians don't have real-life solutions many times for real-life problems. Now, on your table, you've got a little card there. I want you to pull that out. Pull out this card, and on the front of this card, we're going to look at the state of where Christian men are in America. We're going to be real here tonight. Now these statistics say right at the top of the card, for every 10 men in the church, nine will have children that leave the church. Eight will not be satisfied with their jobs. Six can only pay the monthly minimums on their credit card. Five will have a major problem with pornography. That number is actually too low. This data is about 10 years old. Christianity Today last June reported that 67% of Christian men dabble in porn on a regular basis. And four will get divorced, affecting more than a million children a year. Now, these statistics are about the Christian men in the United States. Men, can I be real with you? Can I ask hard questions tonight, men? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, ask hard questions. First of all, do we believe these statistics to be true? Yeah. Okay, this is where real men are, real Christian men are. Now, here's the question we want to grapple with tonight. 
if we want to change these statistics, are we going to have to do something different in men's ministry? If you want the results to be different, are you going to have to do something different? Okay, that's the place we've got to start. That what we're currently doing in America in men's ministry is getting us these results. And I don't know about you, but I don't like these results. I had cancer three years ago, and there's something about getting that telephone call from the doctor that says, hey, Lonnie, that's a stage two melanoma. We need you to come in tomorrow. We got to cut that baby out. And they got it all, and I'm fine. But the point is, I don't want to waste my life anymore. And I travel all over the country and talk to Christian men. And when they look at their own lives, and when they look at statistics like this, most men that I talk to are say, I'm sick and tired of milk toast Christianity. If my Christianity doesn't work, then what's it worth? And men are looking for real-life answers to real-life problems and how God has solutions. And men, that's the purpose of every man a warrior. Now, every man a warrior was born out of a crisis of faith. I went on staff with the Navigators, and I was trained for six years in how to teach good, solid theological truth. I knew how to teach the book of Romans. I knew how to teach the book of Galatians and Ephesians and Genesis and these wonderful theological truths of the Bible. And in 1988, I'm with this Bible study, and I noticed that the men are a little bit disgruntled. And so I said, men, before we do the Bible study, tell me about your life. Tell me what's going on with you. And I unpopped this cork, and we couldn't get that cork back on the bottle. We never got to the Bible study. For the next hour and a half, the men began to share how their marriages were hurting, their children weren't doing well, Money was really tight. In fact, debt was overwhelming a pressure on their life. In the 1990s and 2000, in my counseling ministry, more and men told me how they, when they were really frustrated, they dabbled in porn. And I got a wake-up call that day because I realized that my six years of training in how to teach theological truth, and don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with that except that it wasn't helping the men I was trying to minister to. Men, let me ask you a question. What percent of your life energy is currently being consumed by the issues of money, marriage, raising children, sex, moral purity, work, going through hard times, and if you're a Christian man, trying to walk with God and try to make your life count? What percent of your life energy is being consumed by those issues? 100%. I'm going to say 90, but you're right. It's overwhelming. Now let me ask you another question. Does it make sense that if I'm leading you in a men's Bible study, we ignore those issues? That doesn't make sense to me either. I'm a Kansas farm boy. That doesn't make me stupid. Doesn't make me practical though. Because if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So in 1988, I had this crisis of faith. And I did church consulting for five years, and I talked with dozens of pastors about men's ministry, and they told me a similar story. And this is not to be critical, but many pastors told me this story. Lonnie, we never had a class in seminary on money, marriage, raising children, sex, moral purity, work, going through hard times. That was not something we ever discussed, and that was not in my training either. And so in 1988, I said, Lord, it's not working, and I began to pray on a regular basis God, we need a new Bible study, something that helps men succeed in life, something that deals with the issues that they face every day. And I began to pray dozens of times. I mean, I brought this up to the Lord in the next 20 years at least two to 300 times. Now, I got something funny to tell you. I kept praying, God, would you hurry up and get someone else to write it? And on May the 2nd, 2009, I'm out on my prayer walk, and that same prayer came out of my mouth. Lord, we need a new Bible study, something that would help men succeed in life, walk with God, love their wives, train their children, manage money. Would you hurry up and get someone to write a good Bible study? And the Lord spoke to me and said, yeah, the time is right, and I want you to do it. Well, I was shocked. I never thought of myself as an author. But men... Ladies, too, I'm here to tell you that God had been writing this Bible study in me for those 20 years. 
And I want you to know that this Bible study did not come out of me sitting in my office doing research. This Bible study came out of real life trials and suffering. It was 1991 when the Lord spoke to me in my quiet time. I was having my quiet time in Psalm 66. It says, praise our God, O people, and let the sound of his praise be heard, for he has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, O God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison. You let men ride over our backs. We went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. And I don't know, that's not any real fancy passage, but I read this and the Lord said, Lonnie, you're going to go through testing. This is February of 1991. I had no idea what that meant. I'd been married for seven years to a wonderful wife. She and I had met as missionaries in communist Romania. She was a Boston city girl. I was a Kansas farm boy. We met in Romania. And we were both on Navigator staff. We worked together for three years. We got married, came back, had two children. We're seven years into our marriage. And the Lord speaks to me and said, you're going to go through testing. Four months later, we received some videotape from her parents. Her dad had taken all this old eight millimeter tape and he put it on a VHS. Remember, this is 1991. We all had VCRs. And we put the kids to, better, to bed. And we put that, VC, that VHS tape in the VCR. And we got to see all these pictures of my wife, June, when she was a little girl growing up. Here was mom and dad when they were 40 years younger. Here was her brother, Don, her sister. And then there was pictures of an older man with white hair named Grandpa. And while we're watching this video, my wife fell off the couch, went into the floor, got into the fetal position, and began to have convulsions. Now, I wanted to call 911. She's a registered nurse. She said, no, no, just stay here with me. And in the next 20 minutes, she is convulsing uncontrollably. And I'm trying to hold her, and I'm a, I used to be a strong man. I couldn't stop the convulsing. I finally got her back up on the chair. I said, what happened? What happened? And out of her mouth came these words that changed our life forever. She said, I think my grandfather abused me. Within three weeks, we went into hell my wife began to have multiple flashbacks of something that she had repressed that over 10 years, Grandpa had dragged her into the basement and done horrible things to her. And she's never recovered. She's been in counseling for 25 years, and I don't have time to go into it, and this is probably not the right place to discuss it. My point is, is that I had to figure out how to walk with God in the midst of hard times. I had to figure out how to love my wife like Christ loved the church when we didn't really have a marriage anymore. My wife was so incapacitated for so many years, she stayed in her bedroom 18, 20 hours a day, and I became a single dad. And uh, basically, I learned how to be a parent because I recognize nobody is training my children. My wife's incapacitated. I'm off at my job. Nobody is training my children. These were the years when I wrestled with God in my quiet time more deeply than ever before. And I cried out to God. Men, how many of you have ever gone through something hard in life? Raise your hands. We live, ladies, I know it's the same for you too. We live in a fallen world. And the vast majority of Christian men, when they go through hard times, this is the teetering point. This is the place where they choose which direction they're going to go. And if you're a man and you go through Every Man a Warrior, we're going to teach you at least five different lessons on what to do when you face hard times. Because I remember the mornings when I would wrestle with God and he gave me 1 Peter 4.19. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do what's right or do what's good. Men, one of the things you're going to learn is how to go through hard times. And when you go through hard times, this is going to be in something in Every Man a Warrior. 
when you go through hard times, how to go to God and do what's right. How to go to God and do what's right. The vast majority of Christian men, when hard things happen, whether their children start to go directions that they, don't, they shouldn't, or the marriage starts to go south, or as the brother just shared, you know, you lose your job, or something else happens. Most Christian men don't know what to do. And it's my opinion that they've never been taught how. And that's why Every Man a Warrior is such a practical course for men. It teaches you how to respond when marriages begin to hurt, when children aren't doing well, when money's tight, or when other issues come up like deep woundedness, whether it's in your wife or whether it's in you. I want to tell you three stories. These are stories that are in Every Man a Warrior. There's 53 stories in Every Man a Warrior. These are stories of real men dealing with real life issues and how God has solutions. But I want you to grasp these stories as examples of how men need to find solutions from the scripture for the problems they face. I don't remember when this was, but it was on a Saturday morning at about 10 o'clock when I got a call from Ted and Cindy. I had just met Ted and Cindy two weeks before. I went to a really large church back in Omaha, and uh, they had had a prayer meeting, and it was the first time I'd ever met them. This was an older couple in their 50s, and I thought, boy, they really pray well. I mean, they must be really spiritual. And, and so I went up afterwards and asked them if they would pray for my ministry. This is about 25 years ago. Ted and Cindy, they got to know me a little bit. They said, sure, and so I gave him my phone number. And so on a Saturday morning, he calls, and he says, Lonnie, would you talk to my wife? And I said, sure. I mean, I thought they were going to ask me to come speak or do something, you know. I didn't know it, but she is crying. I mean, she's not only crying, she is screeching, and she is really yelling. And into the phone, she says these words, I want a divorce. I hate living like this, and this man will never change. And I said, give the phone back to Ted. <laughs> so Ted and I got together the next two days later. I said, Ted, what happened? Cindy was really mad. And for the next 20 to 30 minutes, Ted began to describe their marriage. They'd been married for about 40 years. They'd always struggled. Cindy always had, you know, expectations that were way too high. And, uh, uh, she, you know, he could never be good enough. And uh, he basically explained that their marriage was struggling because it was her fault. Now, ladies, it's okay if you laugh at this point. Most women do at this point. I said, Ted, that's really hard. I'm sorry. That, I, I had no idea. Can I ask you a question? Ted, how are you doing at fulfilling your biblical responsibility as a husband? Now, Ted's been going to church all of his life. He's actually a leader in the church. And when I asked him this question, he said, I don't know. What are you talking about? So we open my Bible to Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And gave up his life for her. And I said, Ted, what do you do to give up your life for Cindy? What do you do to prove that she is more valuable to you than anything else? And this man who's been a leader in his church and been going to church most of his life looked at the verse and he looked at me and he looked at the verse and he looked at me and he said these words. I don't know, I've never seen this before. We flipped over to 1 Peter 3, 7. I like it in the NASB version. It says, Husbands, live with your wife in an understanding way and treat her with honor. And I said, Ted, what do you do to honor your wife? What do you do to treat her special? And do you understand what's going on inside of her? Do you understand where all this pain is coming from? And Ted looked at the verse, and he looked at me, and he looked at the verse, and he said the exact same words. I don't know. I've never seen this before. Now, men, if you're a married man, and you don't know the basic foundational truths of the scripture on marriage, then your marriage is probably going to end up like everyone else's. I find that most Christian men have never known or have forgotten 
the most fundamental biblical truths on how to live life successfully. In the 1980s, I taught long-range financial planning to uh, Navigator staff. I traveled around the country teaching these seminars on biblical finances. Now, before that, I had been mentored by a man by the name of Jake Barnett. Jake is home with the Lord now, but Jake was a builder in Minneapolis. And in the 1950s, early 1960s, he came to Christ. He was uh, discipled by the Navigators, and he learned how to meditate on the Scripture and write out application how to meditate on a verse and then actually write down an application. And Jake wanted to be a builder. So he decided he would look up every verse in the Bible on money or how to run a business according to a Bible, a Bible verse. And he spent his life doing that. Now one of the verses Jake came across was Proverbs 22.7. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower becomes the slave of the lender. And Jake was convicted by that. He knew that borrowing money in the construction business was just the norm. That's the way everybody did it. And yet he had this Bible verse that says the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is the slave of the lender. And as he and his wife prayed over this verse, they became convinced that God wanted them by faith to try and experiment with starting and running their business, their construction business, without debt. So for the next five years, they scrimped and saved and scrimped and saved, and they put enough money together that when they started their business, they had enough money that they could build their first home. Now, back in the 1960s, you could go to the local lumber yard in Minneapolis where he was building homes, and they would carry you for 90 days without interest, okay? So Jake went down there with one other employee, and they got all the lumber and drywall and electrical and concrete, and they built their first home. While they're starting on their second home, the first home sells. Then they did their third home, and that first year they built seven homes, all without debt. The second year it was 15. The third year it was more. It took about seven years, but Jake got to a place in his construction company where he was building 50 homes a year, all without debt, because he had Proverbs 22.7 as a starting place. Now, how many of you remember 1982 when interest rates hit 21%? Okay, every builder in Minneapolis went out of business because hardly anybody could afford a home. And so construction just stopped. Not Jake, he didn't have any borrowed money at 21%, so he kept building homes. There was a few people buying homes, and he was able to supply them. One day a competitor drives up and says, Jake, i got to ask you a question. You build bigger and better homes than I do, and you sell them for less money. How do you do it? And Jake says, well, how do you uh, finance the homes that you build? Now, the next words out of this guy's mouth, he's non-Christian, but they're key words. This non-Christian said, well, like everyone else, I guess. I go to the bank, I get a construction mortgage, we build the house, and then I convert the construction mortgage into a monthly mortgage, and then when the house sells, I I, uh, pay off the the mortgage, and, and, and that's how we do it. That's how everybody does it, right? Jake said, well, how much does that add to the cost of a home when you do it that way? And the guy said, oh, about $10,000. Now, when Jake told me this story, my brain kicked in. 50 homes a year at a competitive advantage of $10,000 a home. I'm trying to get all the zeros. Jake was beating the competition by half a million dollars a year because he start and ran his business without debt, based upon a biblical principle. Now, statistics tell us that Christians are just as much in borrowed money as non-Christians. And here again, we have forgotten the most fundamental biblical truths on how to live life successfully. Now, the reason I wanted you to remember what that other builder said, if you and I as Christian men and women don't know biblical truths on these areas of life, then you know what happens? We live our lives like everyone else, and we get the same results as everyone else. If you don't know biblical truths on marriage, 
then I suspect you're treating your wife like everyone else does, or the way you saw dad treat mom, because that's our default mode. I was in Albany, New York, here this couple years ago, had a group of about 90 men together, and uh, I said, men, how many of you have children every hand shot in the air? And I said, men, how many of you want your children to grow up to follow God? And every hand went up. And I said, great, men, me too. Men, how many of you as fathers, Christian dads, are willing to sacrifice for your kids? Are willing to do what's necessary so that your kids get the training they need to grow up and be wise young adults who make good decisions and follow God? And every hand shot into the air. And I said, great, men, me too. Let me ask you one more question. Men, how many of you know three Bible verses on raising children? And not one hand went up. Men, how important is you to you are the issues of money, marriage, and raising children? And do you know any Bible verses that dictate how you live in the areas of money, marriage, and raising children? Because if you don't, then you are living like everyone else and you will get the exact same results as everyone else. That's the purpose of every man a warrior. To invest in yourself for nine months to a year so that you can get the training you need to know biblical truth on money, marriage, raising children, sex, moral purity, work, going through hard times, and how to walk with God as a Christian man and how to make your life count. Men, every man a warrior is an investment in yourself. How many of you went to college? How much did that cost? I mean, you went to college as an investment in yourself so that you could have a productive career, right? Doesn't it make sense to spend $36 on a nine-month Bible study that would help you have success in the areas of your life that you really want to succeed in? Money, marriage, raising children, sex, more purity, work, going through hard times. Does that make sense to you? Now, it seems to make sense to a lot of men because in the last four and a half years, we've sold 65,000 Every Man a Warrior books. It's been translated into four languages, and it's gone into 16 different countries. No matter where you are as a man, if you're married, your life is going to be consumed by these issues that we call the 90%. Now, men, I want to take just a step back here. Because tonight, before we can help you in the issues of money, marriage, raising children, sex, moral purity, work, going through hard times... Before we can help you succeed in those areas, there's one other issue that we have to get right in your life. And I call this the one thing. The one thing. What is the one Bible passage that is above all other Bible passages for you as a Christian? Well, you may have your favorite, but let me tell you what mine is. It's found in Matthew 22. It's verses 36 through 38. Jesus is getting all the press. The Pharisees are a little bit ticked off at Jesus because, you know, you got to feel sorry for the Pharisees. You know, Jesus is healing the sick and raising the dead and feeding 5,000, and the poor Pharisees are just struggling to make ends meet, you know. So they're a little bit ticked off at Jesus. So one of them, a lawyer, goes to Jesus in Matthew 22, verse 36, and he says, Teacher, which, he's trying to start an argument, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, I think this lawyer's thinking about the Ten Commandments. And if Jesus chose the number three, then he was going to choose the number five. Or if Jesus chose number five, he was going to choose number eight. Then they get into a lawyer's quarrel. You know, that's what lawyers do. Okay. Any lawyers here? Good. Okay. Now, uh, nobody wants to admit it. All right. So this lawyer tries to trick Jesus. Jesus didn't bite. You know what Jesus said? He didn't go to any of the rules. He went right to the relationship. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first 
And this is the greatest commandment. Folks, there is something so huge in this passage. Something so significant. Jesus said that loving God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your soul, with all your mind, this was the first and this is the greatest commandment. Nowhere else in all of Scripture did Jesus or Moses or the Apostle Paul ever say anything like this. Now Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first. This is the first. That means it's the highest priority of our Christianity. It's the thing that we should do before we do anything else. It's also the greatest. It's the thing that has the largest impact in transforming your life and heart. One of the biggest battles I feel that we have in the church today, in my opinion, is that we have exchanged a love relationship with God for some form of intellectual or deductive reasoning. And I'm not saying there's not a proper place for that. I always admire good thinkers. Jesus said that the most core issue of your Christianity is about a relationship with God. When we did Every Man a Warrior and field tested it for two years, the thing that men said changed their life the most was for the first time in their life, they got consistent in spending time alone with Jesus. Many men said that it was the first time in their life that they had ever heard God's voice. Other men said it was the first time they ever felt God's love. And our Christianity needs to be about a transformed life. The reason we look like everyone else and are getting the same results as everyone else is one, sometimes we don't know the scripture and we don't obey it, but two, we don't know deeply in our heart the God of the universe. I live in Omaha, Nebraska. We have Offutt Air Force Base there. We started Every Man a Warrior in a church, a smaller church of about 400 down in Papillion, which is near off at Air Force Base. There was a retired Air Force captain who had taken early retirement. He was in his mid-40s, and so he had some extra time on his hands. Now, no one had ever taught him how to have a quiet time. And since he had just taken early retirement, he got into an Every Man a Warrior course at church, and he learned the very first thing in book one we're going to teach you how to walk with God. This is how to have a daily quiet time. Now, men, don't get scared off on this. We're going to start you at 15 minutes. Now, it's going to grow from there, but we're going to start you at 15 minutes. Anyway, he started having a daily quiet time. Now, he had been raised in a military family. His dad had been in the army. His dad had treated mom like a private. And so even though this man was a Christian and well-liked, he treated his wife like a private. And everyone in the church knew it. So he's in book two. Book two is on marriage and raising children. And in book two, he's memorizing and meditating on some of these verses that I already shared. Ephesians 5.25, 1 Peter 3.7. And he got to one of these verses and God spoke to him. The God of the universe, remember, this is a military man. He understands authority. The God of the universe spoke to him and said, you're not kind to your wife and it dishonors me. And this man, I mean, he couldn't get away from this. You're not kind to your wife and it dishonors me. No one had ever spoken those words to him before. He had grown up in a home where his dad treated mom this way. That was his default mode. And because he'd never studied the scriptures before, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave up his life for her, or husbands, live with your wife in an understanding way and treat her with honor, those verses had never become real to him before. And now he's meditating on those verses, and the God of the universe says, you're not kind to your wife, and it dishonors me. Within the next three days, he started to apologize to his wife. Within a week, he had asked for forgiveness. 
He could not spend time alone with God without listening and hearing God say, I don't want you to treat your wife like that anymore. He so radically changed that within three months, the whole church had seen a difference in this man. It was because he had spent time alone with God that God pointed out an area in his life that radically changed his marriage. A year went by and they asked me to come back. They were launching Every Man a Warrior for the second year. And of all the men, they had about 16 men go through it the first year. Of all the men who wanted to share this testimony, this Air Force captain wanted to share his testimony. And he got up there and shared how God had spoken to him. And not only had it healed his marriage, that his marriage had become the happiest it had ever been. That year, 75 men signed up for Every Man a Warrior because they saw a man whose life had changed because the God of the universe spoke to him. Now, it also might have been because his wife went around and told every other woman in the, in the church that her husband had radically changed. So there was a little bit of this going on, I think. Honey, you need to do this too. We have had, we've got three documented situations on video. Men who were served divorce papers in book one and God saved their marriage in book two. And in every situation, it was because the man radically changed. Now, men, here's the point. When you spend time alone with God in the word and prayer, God can speak to you. When you spend time alone with God in the word and prayer, and you focus on the issues of money, marriage, raising children, sex, moral purity, work, going through hard times, and every week you get together with a confidential group of other men and you discuss these issues based upon the story that's in the book, the verses that are in the book, and the quiet times you're having, your life can change radically. Man, I don't know about you, but no man wants to waste his life. No man wants to end up a failure in life. Now, as Christians, we many times quote 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture, how many of you know this verse? All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God will be thoroughly, fit, thoroughly prepared for every good work. How many of you know that verse? How many believe that verse? Okay. Now think about this with me. All scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Literally, that means training in right, wise living and thinking. Men, after we looked at the statistics, do we as men need some training in right, wise living and thinking? Doesn't it make sense to invest nine months to a year of your life in getting the training you need to become successful. Now, I told you about the group in Albany, the group where I said, men, how many of you want your children to follow God? And everybody raise their hand. Men, how many of you are willing to sacrifice? Everybody raise their hand. Men, how many of you know three verses on raising children? Nobody raise their hand. What if we change the paradigm of how we think about men's ministry and we started right here at this church? See, most churches, I've been doing church consulting for years. I've literally worked with hundreds of churches now. Most churches have a wonderful children's ministry. They have a really good women's ministry. And men's ministry is just almost non-existent. If you go to a new town and you ask Christians, what are some of the good churches in town? You'll always hear about the church over here that has a great children's ministry, the church over here that has a great women's ministry. You'll never hear about a church, oh, they know how to minister to the men. What if Liberty Presbyterian, Liberty Corner Presbyterian, this church became a church that discovered how to minister to the men and help them walk with God, succeed in life, and multiply these spiritual truths to another man. 
We have over a thousand churches now that have used Every Man a Warrior. Some of them, our largest church, Grand Rapids, Michigan, has had over a thousand men go through it. In the churches that use it well, half of the men will go on and lead a group of their own. Of those who go on and lead a group of their own, half of them will lead a group multiple times. They will go on and continue to minister to men with the Every Man a Warrior curriculum because it's so practical in nature. Man, I think you're at a crossroads here in this church to decide, do you want to be a man who succeeds in life because you know the truth of Scripture, or do you want to continue to be a man who gets the same results as everyone else because you don't know the truth of Scripture? If this church uses every man a warrior for four or five years, you know what will become the norm? It'll become the norm that a Christian man knows five verses on marriage and how to put them into practice. It'll become the norm that a Christian man here in this church would know five verses on money and how to put them into practice. It'll be the norm that a Christian man will know five verses on raising children and how to put them into practice. And that a Christian man would know several verses on going through hard times, going to God and doing what's right, and he'd know about seven verses on how to walk with God consistently. Men, if that is something you want, I encourage you to go after this. Make a choice. Ask the Lord, Lord, do you want me to do this? Because I'm here to tell you that it is not in God's plan for you as a man to fail. That's not part of your God-given assignment for you to be a failure. But many Christian men fail because they don't make the next step to go and get the training they need to walk with God, succeed in life, and spiritually multiply. It's your choice, men. I hope you don't have to get cancer to be confronted with the reality that we're all going to die. I did, and I realized I don't want to waste my life in any way. But you can be a man who knows how to walk with God, how to love your wife, how to train your children, how to manage money, how to fight to stay morally pure and get a, keep away from pornography. To be a man who knows how to go to God and do what's right when hard times hit, because you all know it, hard times are going to hit. And then to be a man who makes his life count for that which would last for eternity by passing these spiritual truths onto your sons, your daughters, your grandchildren, and other men. Men, you can win. You can win in the battles you fight every day. God has given you the scripture so that you can win. It's just that you've got to go focus on it and be with a group of men who will encourage you to become the man, the husband, and the father that God wants you to be. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for the men that have been up here already and shared how, as they did every man a warrior, they got closer in their walk with you. And they begin to learn these principles. Father, we cry out to you for men everywhere, not only in this church and in this city, but throughout our whole nation. Lord, our nation is rapidly going down a hill of destruction and we're picking up speed as we go. And sometimes we don't know what to do. But the scripture says that in the Bible, we have answers to the questions we face as men. Would you help us to discover those answers and put those answers into place? And Lord, would you help us to love our wives well, train our children well, manage money so that we can use it for the kingdom of God, fight to stay morally pure. Help us to be men who would shine like bright lights, like the stars in the universe in a crooked and depraved generation as we live out the word of truth. Thank you for this time tonight, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.